Thank you very much for, for your invitation and for the kind presentation. Well, indeed, I'm, 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 going, to let, I'm going to present a, a work that we have uh, finished a few months ago with Laurent Boudin and Francesco Salvarani. Laurent Boudin is in my lab. Uh, Francesco Salvarani is in uh, Pavia in, in Italy. And they both are there, by the way, in the audience. Um, so our topic uh, is, the, is the following. Throughout the talk, we are interested in studying uh, exelman crohs systems, both in, in finite dimension and, and also in infinite dimension. So here on this first, first slide, let me recall what is the exelman crohs system, the very simplest one, uh, linear uh, with uh, steady coefficients and so on. So it is given in the form of a linear system um, uh, with uh, n agent, which may be in RD, uh, each, each agent may be in RD, okay. Each agent evolves according to an interaction with all other agents with coefficients, uh, sigma ij, that are non-negative coefficients, which stand for the possible interaction of the agent number i with the agent number j. Well, and uh, um, for this kind of system, which is paradigmatic for describing uh, convergence to consensus, we say that we have consensus whenever all agents, whenever all state variables uh, are all equal. And when they are equal, they must be equal to their average, uh, their mean. Their mean will, uh, will be uh, denoted with a bar throughout my talk. Well, but uh, more precisely in this talk, we will be interested in the non-symmetric case. So throughout the talk, I will say that the system is symmetric whenever uh, the matrix, the matrix consisting of the coefficient sigma ij is symmetric. That is, sigma ij is equal to sigma ji for all i and j. And otherwise, it, it will be said to be non-symmetric. So the non-symmetric case is the particular focus of our of our talk of our um, work. Sorry. Let me let me recall that Exelman Crow's models are. Um, uh, well-known models in a collective, in social dynamics, but of course there are many, many other models and variants of interests, such that, of course, the very celebrated cocker smale second order models. But here, we, I, I would like to raise the main ideas uh, that we want to, to promote for the very, very simplest model, which, which is this uh, Exelman and Crows model. So here at the bottom of my slides, as you can see, I have cited several uh, authors who, who, have, um, uh, who have contributed on, um, on, uh, on uh, collective dynamics, but of course the, the, uh, the list is very far from being complete. Well, uh, to, to explain the main ideas, um, let me write the, the linear system in a matrix form so let me introduce the matrix A, which is written here, which is the matrix containing the coefficients uh, sigma i j, which stand, let me repeat, for the, for the interactions of the coefficients. And uh, uh, on the diagonal uh, of the matrix A, you can find the sum of all other coefficients row by row. So this just means, finally, that capital A is nothing but an arbitrary matrix, which is uh, with real coefficients, which is of size capital N, whose coefficients of diagonal are non-negative, and which is chosen such that if you take any row of the matrix, then the sum of coefficients along this row must be equal to zero. This is such a matrix. Well. So we can, do, uh, we can do some preliminary remarks on such matrices A. Let me, let me first of all assume that for every agent I, there always exists at least another 
agent j such that sigma i j is positive, is non-zero. So this assumption means that there, there are no completely isolated agents. Every agent has at least one interaction with another agent j. This is what it means. So let me come back to the preliminary remarks on the matrix A. Given the construction of the matrix A, you can see immediately that since the sum of all coefficients on every row is equal to zero, it means that the vector E that is written here, the vector E consists of one, 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 one. The vector E must be an eigenvector of A associated with the eigenvalue zero. So E is, the, e is in the kernel of A. And, and actually, by a very simple Gershgorin circle argument, you can easily see that all other eigenvalues of A, I mean, all other eigenvalues different from zero, must have a negative real part. So it means that essentially, in some sense, uh, the matrix A is stable, except that the matrix A has a kernel. Uh, and actually, we will, we will see that um, under an additional assumption, the kernel of A is one dimensional, restricted to the, uh, to the straight line generated by E. Well, let me recall the, the well-known and simplest case where the matrix A is symmetric. So symmetric here in finite dimension means that A coincide with its transpose. Then in that case, all of that is very well known, uh, we have convergence to consensus. How can it be seen? It's very easy. First of all, uh, if you look at the sum of all other, of, uh, of all states, sorry, uh, yi of t, then you can see immediately that this sum remains constant with respect to time. It is just a simple computation. If you derivate with respect to time the sum of the yi, then you obtain y dot scalar product with e. e is the vector of uh, 1, 1, 1, 1. y dot is equal to a y. OK? So you, you obtain a y scalar e. But since uh, a is symmetric, this is the same as y scalar product with a e. But a e is equal to 0. So you easily obtain that the sum of all states is a constant. But it is, a, it is exactly the average, huh, actually. OK. Um, so the average uh, of the yi uh, remains constant in time. Now, second computation, which is also very easy, you compute the variance. So the variance is the. Um, uh, the discrepancy between y of t and its average. You, 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 you take the square of it, you differentiate with respect to time, and you always obtain something which is negative. This means that the variance is strictly decreasing. And because of that, using a classical Lyapunov argument, you immediately infer that y of t converges exponentially to its average. So this is the usual exponential convergence to consensus. It is, it is an extremely uh, simple, robust, and well-known argument. But the fact is that now if you, if you focus on the non-symmetric case, this very simple argument does not work, just because now the scalar product of AZ with Z um, has no sign. I mean, this scalar product may be positive for some z. So the proof cannot be uh, so simple as before. And the fact is that in the existing literature, unless, of course, we missed something, it seems that there is no existing L2 theory, uh, as, we, as, we, uh, as I can say with, uh, with, code, with codes. I mean, I do not know any kind of Lyapunov argument, Lyapunov functional of quadratic type that would decrease to zero exponentially. Um, it's, um, instead, instead of uh, L2 theory, 
there is a, a quite well-known L-infinite theory that has been achieved, for instance, by uh, Jabin, Moch, and Tadmor in a series of articles. And it will be one of the objectives of our work to design, um, to design also in the non-symmetric case, uh, L2 theory. That is to, to be able to design a Lyapunov functional, uh, a quadratic functional that decreases to zero in the non-symmetric case. Now, uh, in parallel, let us also study the infinite dimensional case so when you let capital N tend to the infinity, formally, um, uh, you obtain the following equation. So here, uh, uh, now, Y is a function of T and X. Um, X belongs, let's say, to some, uh, to some set capital omega, now D. And uh, passing to the limit, and more precisely, passing to the graph limit in the sense of Medvedev, uh, you obtain the following differential equation, but which is now in infinite dimension. dy over dt is a kind, uh, is, a, um, is a, this integral, uh, integral of sigma of x, x star times y at, at state uh, x star minus y at state x. So again, it is written uh, in the matrix or operator form. Uh, y dot is equal to a y, where now uh, a is not a matrix anymore, it's, a, it's an operator, and a is this integral operator written here. Actually, as you can see, a can be written as the difference between, um, between two operators, k and ms. k is a purely integral operator, so it's a compact operator, while ms uh, MS is the, the operator of multiplying the function by the function capital S. And capital S is actually a partial integral of sigma. Okay. And so our objective uh, is to understand in the finite or in the infinite dimensional setting, what is the asymptotic behavior of the state Y of T? Okay. Let me go on. Uh, to, in order to, to state the main result, let me uh, recall several issues on graphs. First, in the finite dimensional setting. So in the finite dimensional setting, sigma is a matrix uh, consisting of the coefficients sigma i, j. Then to this matrix, sigma is classically associated a graph, a directed graph, uh, g, which, is, uh, which has by definition an edge from i to j whenever the coefficient sigma i j is positive. So what it means is that um, actually when an entry uh, of the matrix capital A is exactly equal to zero, uh, then it means that there is no direct interaction between the corresponding gens, let's say i and j. Uh, while when an entry of A is positive at row I and uh, column uh, J, then it means that um, the agents Y and J directly interact. But of course, two agents may interact indirectly. In that case, it may exist a path of agents joining two agents, which is the, the usual definition for a graph of being strongly connected. So we say that the graph is strongly connected if two uh, arbitrary agents are um, connected, may, may it be directly or indirectly through a path. Um, and if the graph is not strongly connected, like it is, for instance, uh, for this graph there, you can always split the graph into strongly connected components. For instance, on the graph here, you can see that this graph uh, is not strongly connected, but has three strongly connected components. If you want this graph to become uh, strongly connected with, uh, with only one strongly connected component, I mean, 
then in that case, you see you can add uh, some interactions like I, did, like I did here. Okay, so this is the classical, um, the classical notion of a graph of being strongly connected. Um, now, let me also explain how to generalize this notion of strong connectivity to infinite dimension. Well, I am not so sure that this notion is classical, at least uh, with my co-authors, we were not able to find it in the existing literature. So let me explain what we, what we did. It is a quite natural um, extension to the infinite dimensional setting. So let, uh, instead of having a matrix, sigma, now we have a function, a function of two variables on a given domain, sigma. And to this function, we can as well associate a graph and we do as follows. We, we consider all possible Lebesgue points of this, of this function sigma. Um, okay, so we call, we call these points the vertices of the graph. And now when you take two different vertices, well, we will say that um, uh, the peer x1, x2 is an arc whenever the second point, the point x2, belongs to the support, to the essential support of the function sigma taken at the point x1. So this is the notion. You can represent in your head the support as being a, a kind of ball, okay? And when uh, you can find in the in a same ball, in the same support, the two points x1 and x2, we say that the two agents directly interact. And this is the notion of direct interaction. Well, and now uh, extending the finite dimensional setting uh, is done as follows. We say that the graph, the graph is strongly connected whenever for two given arbitrary vertices, you can find a path of arcs which are joining uh, the, the two agents, x and x star, meaning that this property of belonging to the essential support is iterated along a path. Okay, moreover, and uh, for technical reasons in the proof, we also add uh, in the definition of a graph to be strongly connected, um, the fact that the function S, capital S that I, that I defined on a previous slide, uh, should have a positive essential infima. What does it mean? Concretely, it means that every or almost every agent can interact at least with a significant enough continuum of, of other agents. Okay, now the theorem. The theorem is the following. It is valid um, in finite or in infinite dimension. We assume that the graph associated to sigma is strongly connected. In that case, so the conclusion will be that we have exponential convergence to consensus. And uh, to prove that, what we prove, so the, the more precise items are the following. First item. There exists a unique, um, a unique element V in the kernel of A star. So A star is the transpose of A if you are in the finite dimensional setting. And if you are in infinite dimension, it is the adjoint, the adjoint in L2. There exists a unique V such that V is positive. The scalar product of V with E is equal to one. It is to normalize it, okay? Uh, and since V is positive, we can consider what we call the weighted mean. The weighted mean is that object. Uh, the weighted mean of uh, Y of T is the scalar product of Y with V along the vector E. Then this weighted mean is the guy that remains constant with respect to time. And now for the, for the convergence result, what is true is that every solution uh, of, the, of, uh, of the system y dot equal a y 
converges exponentially to its weighted mean. So with respect to the symmetric case here, you just have uh, to replace the usual average, the usual the Euclidean average with a weighted average. Uh, the, the, the decay in the exponential, the optimal decay rho in finite dimension coincides with uh, the Fiedler number, uh, which is the, the absolute value of the real part of lambda 2, the second eigenvalue of, uh, of the matrix A. This was already partially known by uh, Olfati Saber and Murray in 2004. Um, it appears also uh, partially in a, in a more recent paper by Weber, Tyson, and Much. And in the infinite dimensional setting, the, the row, the optimal decay, coincides actually with the spectral bound of an operator. And this operator is the operator that we denote here by A2. And A2 is uh, the restriction of A to, to its image and co-restricted to its image. We will see later that it makes sense. So this operator is well defined. Um, so we have convergence to consensus whenever the graph is strongly connected. When it is not strongly connected, what does it mean? It means that you may have several, or maybe an infinite number, why not, of strongly connected components. In that case, in every uh, strongly connected component, you can apply the result. And so you obtain also exponential convergence in each strongly connected component. So it means that you have exponential convergence to clusters in that case. OK, so let me describe the main steps of the proof. The proof essentially relies on, uh, on the analysis of the spectral properties of the operator A. May it be in a finite? or in infinite dimension. So I will always uh, treat the two of them in parallel as far as I can. So first of all, on this slide, uh, I have written how to compute the, the adjoint of A. So the adjoint of A is written here in the finite dimensional setting and here in the infinite dimensional setting. So uh, the first proposition, which is uh, the key in order to define uh, the, the, the weighted average is the following. Under the assumption of strong connectivity, it is true that the kernel of A and also the kernel of the adjoint of A are one dimensional subspaces. This is what I said at the very beginning, actually. I, I said at the very beginning that zero is a simple eigenvalue of A and also of A star. Okay. Um, but as a consequence, as a consequence, it means that there exists a unique V in the kernel of A star, such that uh, V satisfies a normalization condition. Okay. V is unique. Um, but the, the crucial fact is now, the crucial fact is that actually V is positive. So in finite dimension, it means that all its components are positive. And in infinite dimension, it is a function. And we just say that this function is positive. This is the crucial fact. And to prove this fact, actually, we use a, a homotopy argument. We actually, we, we modify the system to make it symmetric because, so we start from the symmetric, because in the symmetric case, of course, A is equal to A star. The kernel of A uh, um, is generated by E, as I said at the beginning. So it means that um, in the symmetric case, this unique V is equal to E. 
E is a, is a constant function equal to one. So of course it is positive. So you start from there and by homotopy, by connectedness, finally, uh, by a homotopy argument, you prove using analyticity and such kind of things that uh, this unique element of the kernel of A star remains positive. So this is the way uh, we follow a modification of the system, starting from the symmetric case, ending at the non-symmetric case, in order to prove that this, um, this element V is positive. Now it is positive. Uh, this is the, the main fact. It can be interpreted as a weight. It gives a new geometry, which is not Euclidean. Uh, in finite dimension, you see that you can weight the usual Euclidean product. Also in infinite dimension here, uh, you can weight the usual space L2 with the weight V. And let me insist here that the fact that V is positive is of course the important thing. So this is the way how we introduce the weighted mean that appears in the main theorem. And this weighted mean is actually exactly the natural limit of the state y of t when t tends to the infinity. Um, actually, we can prove some other uh, geometric and spectral properties. For instance, um, for instance, you can see that if now we consider your joint of A, not in the usual sense, but in the V sense, I mean the joint in the new weighted space, then the kernel of this new joint coincides with the kernel of A, also its image. However, <laughs> however, um, the, the operator A is not V self-adjoint anyway. It's not true. But uh, as a consequence of this lemma, we can introduce the V orthogonal projection in, in the state space. We call it pi there. So pi is the V orthogonal projection, which is mapping capital X to, to the image of A uh, after, after this lemma. So we can, we can use a decomposition of any state Y in capital X into its average part, its average, which is the, the, the V mean, plus the rest, which is pi applied to Y. And in such a way, we can finally define the operator I mentioned uh, for, for stating the theorem, which we call here A2. So A2 is the restriction of A to the image of A and also co-restricted to the image of A. And this guy, uh, this guy is a homomorphism. Actually, actually, uh, this fact is very easy to see in a finite dimension because in finite dimension with a change of basis, you can always write A, the matrix A by block here, um, zero here corresponds to the kernel of A, which is of dimension one. And there at the bottom right, you have the matrix A2. And A2, the matrix A2 is Hurwitz. Uh, Hurwitz means that the spectrum of A2 is uh, on the left, strictly on the left in the complex plane. The, the real part of all eigenvalues of A2 are negative which means that A2 is stable. So of course, since you have already isolated uh, what happens in the kernel of A, which is the, the V average of Y, you now obtain immediately the fact that Y of T converges exponentially to the V average um, uh, Y bar V, which is written here. And moreover, we have the, the sharp rate of convergence, which is given by A2. It is given by uh, the real part of uh, the smallest eigenvalue of A2. 
OK. Uh, in infinite dimension, you can also expect such a kind of proof, but you have to fight a bit more because in the infinite dimensional setting, as you know, the spectrum is not so simple and you can have essential spectrum because, because you are in the non-symmetric case. So, so you have to fight a bit you have to distinguish in the spectrum of A between the discrete spectrum, which is the most, the most familiar part, and the essential spectrum. But fortunately, since you know, the, you know the fact that capital A can be written as the difference between two operators, one of them is compact, and the other is just the multiplication by some function, you can finally arrive at the end. I will, not, I will not enter into the detail here, but essentially uh, to come to the conclusion you use, uh, you use the spectral mapping theorem. So finally, uh, uh, so these are the main steps of the proof to, to establish the exponential convergence to, to consensus at the sharp rate, which is the spectral abscissa of this operator A2. These are the main steps. Uh, well, it is almost for free that we can adapt the all, all previous proof to the discrete time setting. So let me just mention it uh, quickly. Uh, in the discrete time setting, we just replace the y dot with the usual finite difference. Okay, so you you obtain the the Exelman and Kroos classical system written in the time setting. And also, of course, as an adaptation of the main theorem, we have that if the graph associated with the coefficients sigma is strongly connected, then we have an exponential convergence to the consensus. It is also interesting to interpret the result at the kinetic limit so to pass to the kinetic lim limit in the previous uh, in the previous system, it can be done uh, in the in the quite usual way. Okay, so uh, here you can recognize the system, the Exelman and Kroos system. Okay, um, the but now the coefficients, the coefficients sigma i j are written in the form of a function sigma taken at some arbitrary points xi and xj that stand for, in some sense, for the positions of the agent uh, i and j. Um, we want the, the point xi, xj not to move in time. So we impose the fact that xi dot is equal to zero. So you, you see here it is a slight variant of the usual uh, of a usual kinetic system uh, because usually in a kinetic system you would you would have a motion here but here there is no motion okay now you pass to the kinetic limit in the in the very usual sense with empirical measures and you obtain at the limit a probability measure uh, mu of t that i have written here um, in the form of an absolutely continuous measure, but it can be done also if the measure is not absolutely continuous. The measure is solution of the classical divergence equation, where uh, inside the divergence, the capital X is the interaction vector field. Okay, this is what we usually, what, this is what we obtain by passing to the limit. And uh, the link between this kinetic representation and the graph limit representation is the following. It's written here. The y of tx, which is the solution of the graph limit of the y dot equal a y, the infinite dimensional system, this y just corresponds to the first order moment of uh, the measure mu. Okay. So what is written on this slide says nothing more with respect to what we have already said. 
Uh, anyway, and it is an open problem, if we were able to prove that any solution of this kinetic equation in mu converges exponentially in some sense that I do not know, converges exponentially to its average, then as a consequence, we would recover the exponential convergence of y of t to its v average, but not the contrary, because y of t is a kind of projection of the measure mu. Okay, but uh, we do not have, and I do not know until now, any, any such exponential convergence on uh, such a kinetic equation. Let me now make some, uh, some further comments because I promised at the beginning that uh, as a result of our study, we, we would be able to develop a L2 theory for convergence to consensus. So let me do it now. As a result of uh, the geometric uh, quantities that we have introduced, and as I said, in particular, we have um, uh, we have introduced a weighted mean. Uh, the weighted mean is just uh, that guy. Uh, it is the sum of all states, but weighted by the, the, the components VI of uh, the V. And let me recall that V is the unique element in the kernel of A star, which is normalized in a certain way. So of course, this weighted mean can be also called a weighted expectation in the, in the statistics uh, vocabulary. Now, in the same way, in statistics, you know, in statistics, you have essentially two quantities. You have the average and then you have the variance. So of course, of course, let us introduce also the, the variance, but now the weighted variance. So we, we, we consider the usual variance, but we weight it with the weight V that we have introduced. This is that guy, okay? It is just the expectation which is weighted by V. So for instance, uh, in the infinite dimensional setting, uh, the variance of Y is this integral written here. Huh? If V was equal to one, you would recover the usual variance, which is not weighted, the Euclidean variance. But now it's, it is weighted by V. Well, okay. The fact is, it, it, it is a consequence of the spectral properties um, I, I gave before. The fact is that uh, the, the derivative in time of this weighted variance is exactly equal to Oh, I forgot to sign minus maybe somewhere because it should be negative. Uh, the, yeah, I forgot to sign minus. The, the derivative with respect to time of V is equal to minus term. So minus this double integral of V times sigma times the square of the difference of Y there. So it means, un petit peu plus tard s'il vous plaît, merci. Sorry, I am in my office. <laughs> um, uh, so it means that V is decreasing according to a certain speed, which is written here. And actually there, and thanks to a Lassalle invariance principle argument, we could as well recover the convergence to consensus that we have established in the main theorem. So the novelty there on this slide, and it, it is an outcome of our study, is that we have developed an L2 theory in the non-symmetric case. Of course, you can ask, okay, okay, it's beautiful, but <laughs> what is the interest of doing that? So let me show you uh, what can be the, the, the interest of that. The interest can be to to treat other cases that are uh, variants in some sense of the exelman cross uh, system in which you have a control, a control appearing at the right-hand side of the system, such as uh, in this ongoing work that we are doing with uh, 
Laurent Boudin and Francesco Salvarani, we are exploring the asymptotic um, properties of uh, a system modeling vote opinions. So in this system, uh, let, let, me, let me comment the version in finite dimension. In this, in this, uh, in this system, the first term in the dynamics, you can recover the Exelman and Crohn's system. Uh, uh, this stands for the binary interactions of people, one with each other, with each other. Uh, they, they exchange ideas and their opinions evolve according to the Exelman and Crohn's dynamics in this, with this first term. The second term, as you can see, there is an integral in time. So it means that these terms stands for memory. Uh, it's a memory term, okay? Uh, so you, you, you take into account what happens in the past. Uh, you have a memory. And finally, the third term, in the third term, there is a control and the control is the influence of media. So media can act uh, as they do <laughs> on the opinions of people. And so here we assume that the control is additive in the system and appears there in this, in this way. So this, the control is the opinion provided by the media. And, and so the game here, the control uh, objective is um, how to choose um, how to choose the control, how to choose the opinion that the media will, uh, will uh, promote in order to influence the opinions of people so that uh, they will potentially converge to some consensus. So the fact is that um, this can be done thanks to stabilization methods. We call, we call that in control the Georgievic Queen strategies. The George Lee Queen strategy relies on the design of a good uh, kind of Lyapunov function, which is the, the guy I have written there. And you can see that inside the Lyapunov function, there is exactly the weighted variance. Uh, why we do that? Because if you compute the derivative in time of V, then you immediately find something that depends linearly on the control. And so it's very, very easy then to choose an appropriate control, making this Lyapunov function converge exponentially to zero. And this is exactly the contents of uh, this uh, theorem that I will not comment more, just saying that there exists explicit cons uh, constant controls uh, that if you plug them in, into the system, you obtain a system that converges exponentially to the consensus. So this is the kind of application that we have in mind by uh, designing such a L2 theory. Actually, the L2 theory each is a much softer and probably much more appropriate than the L-infinite theory for such control issues. This is, uh, this is the message. And so let me end with uh, that slide on which I have written several, uh, several uh, issues that are open. Thank you very much for your attention.